Welcome into War Chant TV. This is Ira Schofel, and I'm here today with NIL Stradamus. <laughs> we, we call him NIL Pete. We call him NIL Stradamus. Uh, you might know him as Peter Schoenthal. He is the CEO of Athliance, which is a leading uh, business in the in the uh, NIL space, uh, the ever evolving NIL space. And there's been a lot going on uh, the last couple of months since the last time we did one of these videos. But we want to bring Pete back, Pete back on, Pete back on to discuss some of the uh, the developments. There's there's uh, stuff going on in Washington D.C. Stuff going on at the NCAA. The states are running uh, rough shot, doing their own things. So we got some states now saying that it's illegal for the NCAA to come in their state and do anything and levy any penalties. So it seems like uh, while we we we've called it the Wild Wild West, and we thought maybe it would start to sort out. And I think one of the things we'll talk about here is that you do think that there will be some sorting out of the madness, but it doesn't seem like it's happened just yet. Uh, thanks for joining us, Pete. How you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. It's been a wild couple of months. Uh, things are starting to pick up. Uh, excited to talk about all the updates and the new things happening and how to kind of figure out and decipher what's actually happening versus what's being reported. So excited for today. Yeah, man, I'm, uh, I'm getting confused myself. And, uh, and it seems like, you know, I guess the thing, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is just kind of the tenor of the NIL space and kind of, you talk to a lot of different people, whether it's people that not work at these collectives and uh, athletes. And then also, you know, I think you talk to administrators and, and some coaching friends. Um, you know, I, I don't know, man, like even though this has been going on for a couple of years now, like I've been talking to a couple of older coaches, maybe coaches that have been around the block who uh, are, are just getting more and more frustrated because it seems like NIL uh, and the challenges that come with NIL are not getting any easier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you've said in the past, like maybe the more problems that are created, then that me makes the need for more oversight. Maybe that'll help kind of everything shake out in the end. But like, where are we at right now? Do you feel like uh, things have settled down at all? Or do you think it's it's gotten crazier, which may lead to some sort of reckoning down the road? Yeah, it's a mixture of both. I mean, in certain areas, it's calmed down. Um, in certain areas, it's ramped up. Uh, what I find to be funny though, and I'm sure we're going to discuss this at length on this call is that it's all, what it was the phrase, uh, a much ado about nothing, right? Because in the next two to three years, everything is going to change because, uh, football players, like we're, we're mainly here to talk about football and basketball. They're going to be on salary. And when we talk about NIL and I come on here, a majority of the questions are about collective deals, right? Cause that drives, the quote unquote NIL space. But in my opinion, those are going to go away because let's be honest about what collective deals are. They are salaries masked as marketing deals. And so if salary actually comes and there's a salary cap on the conference level or the national level and the schools figure out how to manage that, well, you're not going to need your boosters to go ahead and do these quote unquote salaries and it's going to go towards actual marketing deals. Um, I can always talk about it. And I'm sure we will talk about what's going to lead towards that. Uh, the Johnson case out of Pennsylvania. Um, that's really what's looming over college athletics and driving the employment versus amateurism argument, which is going to lead to revenue share. But in the meantime, over the next two years, we are dealing with NIL. We are dealing with collective deals. We are dealing with different state laws. We are dealing with whether or not the federal government's going to get involved. And the one thing that's sitting out there, which is, Hello, NCAA. Are you still there? Right. And <laughs> what is that? What, what are they going to do? And uh, I think I have answers for all that today. Well, awesome. Well, starting with the, the right there at the, where you're talking about at the end, like it seems to me, you know, the NCAA has at different stages over the last year tried to maybe kind of you know exert some authority and try to reestablish some authority. They've come out with some clarifications, which we've talked about in the past about what, what collectives can do and what, what, uh, what constitutes a representative of the school and what you're allowed to do. But these States, man, they don't seem to be backing down. It seems like the States are going further and further in, t in terms of telling the NCAA to, to buzz off. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, does the NCAA, do you see the NCAA doing anything to kind of counteract that? Well, they're definitely going to do something, and it's it's a really it's a really tough spot for everyone. So, just to give some context, the NCAA has stated that schools, as of right now, cannot be in, overly involved in NIL. I.e., they can't be the ones paying the athletes, and they can't really run NIL in house. Right? They cannot have 
fans and boosters donate money to an NIL fund. And therefore that individual or that organization gets booster points, priority points, tickets, right? They have to be separate. Well, you have a few states, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and now New York that have not only come out and created state laws that said, wait, no, 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 our schools can be more hands-on and do this, but we are putting in our state law that the NCAA has no ability to come into our state and punish and regulate our schools. Now that's created a whole lot of issues. Throw out the need for uniform rules and competitive balance. Where that gets really interesting is we are on a collision course, a game of chicken between the states and the NCAA. The NCAA is basically saying, no, they sent out a memo last week saying, we don't care what your state law said. You're following our rules because you are a voluntary member of the NCAA. And if you want to be a part of it, you're going to follow our rules. Now, when I say that's a game of chicken, it means is the NCAA going to follow through? And if they do, does Texas or Texas A&M or Kansas say we're leaving the NCAA, right? Who's going to blink first? Um, I, I think the NCAA, what they're doing is this. It all goes back to what I said earlier about the employment issue. There is a case, and we've discussed it a little bit before, called Johnson versus NCAA. What that has everything to do, and it's out of Pennsylvania, it's a federal court case, it has everything to do with our student athletes' employees. I, be, I think the way the Johnson lawyers are bringing the case, they're going to win and the NCAA is going to lose. All right. That trial is set for a year down the road. So if the NCAA loses in a year, then you have the appellate process, right? All the appellate courts get involved. Let's say that takes another year, year and a half. That means we are on a two to two and a half year collision course with athletes being deemed as employees. Now, when you're deemed an employee, that means salary. And uh, we're, you know, in pro sports and now in college sports, your salary will be decided based on a salary cap that is dictated by revenue brought in by the league, right? And think of the league either as the NCAA or more importantly, the conferences here, all right? The NCAA is in D.C. right now lobbying, trying to get a quote-unquote NIL bill. See, I don't think they need an NIL bill. And every time I see them talking about the need for NIL legislation, they always throw in, we need a limited antitrust exemption. The reason they're doing that is if they get the antitrust exemption, these athletes won't be deemed employees. All right. Now, the NCAA behind closed doors from everything I've been told is telling Congress we need that antitrust exemption. But to get it, we are willing to do revenue share. We just don't want these athletes to be deemed employees because that's going to hurt Olympic sports and women's sports. And I think they're right. But let's look at the NCAA actually pulling a fast one on everyone. All right. Because if you have the Johnson case, which will be done in two, two, two and a half years, right? Let's start now. The NCAA is five months right now to basically get a bill that gives them antitrust exemption, which also, you know, they want an NIL bill, but they want the antitrust exemption built into it. Because in five months, what happens? We're in an election cycle for another year to 18 months, which means they lose Congress. So if you add the five months I just gave you, plus the 18 months now, that's two years which means by the time that's all done, the Johnson case will be finalizing itself and the NCAA is going to have to do a mad dash to get their antitrust exemption. So what they're doing now is they're either trying to get it quickly or what they're really doing is educating Congress so at the last minute they can get that antitrust exemption. Because, and I know this is controversial, I know people are going to say on the boards, Peter, you're crazy. The NCAA doesn't need a federal bill to go after schools involving NIL infractions. But if they go after schools right now while they're trying to get a bill, Congress is going to look at them and say, you don't need us. You're doing a good job policing the space. All right. So that's what's happening. Now, I assume, Ira, let me know if I'm correct. The follow-up question is going to be, well, then how can the NCAA go after school? What is their power? Is that the question, Ira? <laughs> it's it's one of the it's one of a couple. All right. Yeah. So let's go to that question, right? Everyone likes to talk about Alston, the case that started it all. First of all, the case didn't start anything, all right? That's neither here nor there. People like to talk about it. NIL was happening regardless of Alston. But let's talk about what actually came out of Alston. One, the NCAA is a regulatory body on a federal issue, okay? Great. College athletics is is a federal issue. 
Two, their mission is to enforce uniform rules to effectuate competitive balance. Cool. Everyone's for that. Three, so long as the rules are reasonable and we're going to look at those rules under the antitrust lens. And by the way, antitrust does nothing to do with schools and boosters. It only has to do with athletes. Okay, well, if you have that in Austin, and the NCAA has already come out with saying in NIL they're not going to go after athletes, I think they have everything they need to go after schools. All right? So they don't need a bill. Now, let's talk about the states that put to get the fourth their, their bills. All right? One, they're voluntary members of the NCAA. Right. Right? You don't want to follow Cooley of the state bill, cool? You can leave then. But two, if we get into a legal battle, I think the NCAA is going to rely on Alston because the federal government hasn't come out and said, all right, the NCAA is a federal regulatory body that can't be superseded by states. But the Supreme Court kind of said that. So they're going to rely on the Supreme Court. So I actually think the NCAA is in a better spot than people think. And I also think that game of chicken, it depends on who you are. Listen, I think if Texas A&M says we're leaving, if the NCAA says bye. If Kansas says it, bye. I think the wild card is Texas, and I don't think they're leaving. And I think another key thing in this game of chicken is look at the conference heads. Greg Sankey at the SEC has come out and said we do not want to leave the NCAA. We do not want to break off. So I think it's going to be really important to see what happens over the next five months. But I've been Nostradamus on this, right? <laughs> I've been here. In six months, if the NCAA doesn't get a federal bill, look for some punishments coming and some big ones and look for the fight to start. Okay, so, you know, it's interesting you, you talked about them. Maybe the NCAA is trying to kind of ramp things up. I thought just from the committee we saw that, you know, Kaylee Mudge, an FSU softball player, testified at a couple of months ago, and we kind of talked about how you could tell maybe some of the congressmen and women didn't really know the issue. Uh, just today as we're taping this, you know, they're having hearings and I saw some comments from some Rand Paul and some different people. They seem to they seem to have caught up some. Whether or not you agree with what they're saying, you know, they they do seem to have uh, yeah. caught up some. So it seems like at least the education. Part it's of it, working. The right. lobbying is right. absolutely working, um, and and I think that's important. But you bring up a great point, right? Because because I keep getting into these ar- not arguments but discussions about is the NCAA a federal regulatory body, and are we dealing with a federal issue? The answer is yes. You have states creating bills that say the NCAA can't come in, right? But there, when, when you do that, you're, you're hurting and you're interfering with interstate commerce, right? So let's go back to that hearing. Who, where was that hearing? That hearing was in the, was in the, in the House under the Commerce Committee. Uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis is the head of the Commerce Committee. So that's why the feds are getting involved. In fact, I would argue that Congress probably wasn't going to get involved. They were they were down open to do the hearing, but they probably weren't going to give us a bill until those states started interfering with interstate law and interstate issues. Because think about it, and I'll, I'll pose it to everyone out there, and 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 if you can name it, come come talk to me on the boards. Find me one Division One conference where every member comes from a single state. Right. It ain't out there. It's a federal issue. Go into, and so you, you brought the Johnson case, and I'm not sure the name of the case in California, but they just decided to put push back the case, one of the cases in California for yeah. a full year. Yeah. So that's why, not a case. Why did that happen? That's not a case. That's oh, the, it's legislation. I'm that's sorry. That's the NLRB, right? So the NLRB in California, which is, I think, the National Labor Relations uh, Board, um, was basically tasked with our, they, they were they were posed with a question, are California athlete athletes employees and they basically gave a charge saying, we believe so. And now we've got to do a full investigation and give our findings. And then, you know, then the NCAA and the schools can give us their position and we can have this whole process. And so what the NLRB in California basically said is, you know what? We don't have to do all that. We don't have to be controversial. Let's just see what the Johnson case on the federal level does. And then we'll follow suit. Gotcha. So that's where I, what I mean by the key is what happens with the Johnson case and then based on the Johnson case, does the federal government get involved? So to summarize where we're at right now, because again, this is a lot of legal stuff, administrative stuff. So basically to summarize where we're at right now, if if the, the NCAA would like a federal legislation within the next five or six months, if possible, correct? Yep. Or, or a decision. And then if that doesn't happen, you think the NCAA is going to start cracking down? 
I believe so, yes. Um, okay. uh, we've heard internally of some inquiries being sent out. And what inquiries essentially are preliminary questions uh, as the NCAA gets ready for a full-blown either investigation or charge. Um, some big schools, I can't really get into that right now, but absolutely, yes. And then either way, though, you feel like within two and a half years, two, two to three years, there's probably going to be a move towards employment. Is that pretty much widely accepted now that, that there'll be some sort of employment model? Um, I, it seems like you're seeing more and more people at least saying that, that that's a lot more people are saying that's possible yeah. now than previously. Yeah. So th that's another interesting point. We are headed towards an employment model 100 percent. It's just whether or not they're designated employees. Right? right. Revenue share is coming. There is no avoiding that. Once the Johnson case is done fully and through the appellate courts, and once Congress decides whether or not to act on the limited antitrust exemption, one way or another, there will be a model put through where either on the NCAA level or conference level, there will be a salary cap. Revenue will, will come in and be allocated, and it will be distributed on a split to the schools and then to the athletes. And that will dictate salary. That, that, that's no different than pro sports. When you see a salary cap in pro sports, all that is is they gathered all the – like in pro football, right? Let's say a team has a $100 million salary cap, and there's 32 teams. That's, uh, I think, $3.2 I don't know if I got that right. But just go with my math. Sounds right? good. What that, what, what that means is that the league brought in $6.4 billion, and half went to the owners, and then half goes into a player pool that dictates salary. It's going to be the same thing with college sports. TV dollars, ticketing, merchandise all flows in. We figure out how much money was, was in the pool. You know, probably half will go to the schools. And then we'll figure out how, how to pay the athletes. Is it just football? Is it football basketball? Is there a large chunk that goes to football basketball and then a rest that goes to a pool for the, the Title IX sports? That That is yet to be figured out. I've got like 10, 15 different models on my computer. Um, but yes, in two to three years, no matter what, athletes will be getting salaries. So then we'll go back to schools doing things under the table to go, go around the salary cap. Is that <laughs> a little bit? I, I just, yeah, basically I, I just think there'll be enough to kind of figure that out. Right. And um, it, it'll be interesting what it, what it looks like there. But having said that, all right, let's talk Florida state for a second. That's why there is a two to three year window to get out of the ACC. Because if the salary cap goes to the conference level and we're talking about revenue coming from a TV deal, and we talk about what's being reported with the Big Ten and the SEC basically getting double what ACC schools will be right. getting. If you think kids want to play in the SEC now, <laughs> wait till the money's double too. Right? So, so, so to, to hammer home that point, I just to kind of make sure we're clear on that. So that's why you think it's important that to clarify that that the, the, the athletes probably wouldn't be students or whatever employees or whatever they're going to be classified as as of the universities, but as of the conference, like the conferences would have their own, probably the, con their, the equity would be on the conference level more so than. Yeah. Because it's the only fair way to do it. Right. So whether it's really hard to have the conversation, are they going to be employees or not? Right. Because there's so much legalese that go into it. But when you look towards what are athletes going to get paid, it has to be a salary cap based on the conference because the main dollar driver are the TV contracts. Right. So I, I, I don't I don't see a world in where the SEC and the Big Ten say, you know what, we're going to be team players and we're going to pool all of our dollar, all of our dollars to establish a salary cap. It's just not going to happen. So that's when I said on like our first ever call, I foresee college athletics almost looking like European soccer. Right. Where you have these different leagues. Some of them are power players. And then the, the leagues that aren't power players, you'll have one or two teams in each league that really you know, thrive, and then everyone comes together for a championship. Um, I think that's too risky for Florida State. I, I think Florida State really has to do everything they can in the next two or three years to really figure out an exit plan. And I think that's why you saw Mike Alford and others at the ACC meetings really going hard at the ACC and looking at the grant of rights. They're gearing up for that. They know they don't have to do it right now, but they know that in three years when the new TV money kicks in and we have to pay players – it's one thing if we're at a deficit as a university. It's another thing if we can't pay players enough competitively. Um, that's a death sentence. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's why, I mean, I've, we've reported it at Warchant and, I, and other people have, I think, uh, intimated as well that 
Uh, Florida State's going to do everything they can to make that happen and, and to get to a different conference, well, uh, particularly argue, one of the two conferences. Yeah, I would argue in three years that if you're probably looking at even from a negotiation, it's like, all right, if we leave the ACC and we pay them the different the difference of three years, it'll cost us a lot of money up front. But in the long term, it's totally worth it. I don't see a scenario in three years where we're still in the ACC. I don't. Even if even if the school has to pay $100, $150 million, even if they have to tap into the endowment fund, I really think that the long-term necessity of that will negate the short-term pain in the pockets. Well, and the, 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 ultimately, we know how it plays out if they don't make the move. You know, yeah. if they just sit here and waste away in, in this conference, there'll be a second, as you said, there'll be a second, maybe third tier uh, team in that kind of conference. And, yeah, and, and they, I, they could talk about how they used to be something. Yeah, and I don't want to be gloom and doom because FSU is going to get out. They are going to solve that. Right. But I think it's important for fans to know the timeline. And, and, and I think that's where whenever we're trying to figure out when are we going to the SEC, when are we going to the Big Ten, I, I'm a bet man. I'm putting the over at uh, two and a half years, and I don't know which side to go on. <laughs> so uh, one more thing. So on the topic of, uh, you know, and again, we're talking about we've looked at a lot of long-term things. Um, yeah. In the short term, the IRS recently clarified to the NCAA about how uh, these collectives, a lot of them have uh, – non-taxable charitable I don't uh, know who talked about that before I, th- I think I think uh, and Al Stradamus I think about talked that about that before. what um what did uh I talked to somebody after the fact and they said we kind of knew this was coming but we didn't know it would come this quickly uh kind of how's that shaking out and how how does that play out because these these collectors have been taking these c- donations under the premise that they would be tax deductible uh, what happens now yeah, that's a million dollar question, right? Um, are, are, are the back tax dollars going to come from the collective? Um, are the people, or is it going to be a scenario where you donated and you thought you were going to have this write off and now you don't have the write off, right? I, I think that's more probably the, the, the probable scenario. Um, I don't think it's really going to impact donors in the short term, though, because the smart collectives, and, and I talked about this on an on three article, the smart collectives are going to their donors and saying, listen, no one likes having to raise all this money for a collective purpose and, and, you know, all that good stuff, but we only need it for two or three more years because we're getting the salary, right? If I'm a, if I'm a smart collective, I'm going to my donors and saying, I only need you for two more years. I only need you to help us be competitive for two more years. Then the rest will get taken care of by the system. And if you pitch that correct way, right. even without all the tax incentives and you know that there's light at the end of the tunnel, I think it's fine. I don't think it's a big deal. So the memo was more scary if this was a longer term uh, issue. I don't think it's having the impact that everyone thought it would initially. Well, and also, and I don't know what the average contribution is, but for the people contributing $500, $750, $250, $1,000, it's minimal. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's, not gonna be, it's not going to be an impact. In, in fact, it really, on the donor side, if you were giving that, thinking you were getting the, 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 the tax deduction, I mean, going forward, it's not going to be a big deal. And then, all right, maybe you get a hit with, uh, you know, you you wrote this off. It was an improper write off. You 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 owe seventy dollars because you gave seven hundred fifty dollars. Right. Like, okay. Um, I want to ask you a few questions uh, from a big picture standpoint. I want to ask you a few of the questions from our message boards. Is there anything else from a big picture standpoint? Because these are more micro issues. Uh, any other macro issues you think that we didn't cover that you think people? are curious about? No, I, I, I just think it's, remember, we, we get caught up in the today. NIL is the Trojan horse to a much larger change that is coming, which is revenue sharing and a professionalization of college athletics. But I think it's only going to be a professionalization on football and maybe some basketball. And it's not going to change how we view things. It's not going to change how we consume. It'll actually probably make things better. Um, kids will stay longer in college. I actually think once you're on a salary structure, there'll probably be less transfers. There'll be, they'll, it, it, it'll be better. Everyone will be playing by the same rules. And we can get back to, uh, you know, just talking about ball rather than, oh, we missed a recruit. Someone must have paid him more. I, I <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, and do, will collectives exist then? Do you think if they go to, to that model? Will collectives I think they will get, I think they'll get eaten up by schools for the most part um, right. because we're, if you if you have kids on salary, if you look at what's left on NIL, it's deals using the logo and deals not using the logo. So deals using the logo are considered group licensing, where you know I'm Chipotle, I want to do a deal with Jordan Travis, but I want the Florida State logo. You're just gonna have to go through the school on that. There'll be a revenue split, right? A third of the money goes to the school, they own the logo. A third of the money goes to Jordan, and a third goes to a player pool, right? 
And then you'll have the individual deals, right? Where like I go to Gordo's, you know, a Tallahassee restaurant, just try to get Jordan to do a commercial, right? Where the collectives can still be there is to help broker those deals. And then also in a scenario like where Gordo's wants to do a deal, but they don't have $10,000 to match Jordan's asking price, maybe a way to help an athlete get some more money is you're funding those deals where it's like, all right, we need $3,000 to help Gordo's out. Uh, that can come in the booster dollars. But I'm not even sure you're going to need that. I'm not sure that's going to move the needle for a lot of athletes. Yeah, but it would be nice that it's there. And, and I think oh. that was kind of the initial premise is uh, if, a, if an athlete wants to go try to hustle and make some money, they can. But if they don't want to, they don't. You bring a great point. When you say your collective is going to be around, yeah, to a certain extent, but what's really going to happen is NIL is going to be what we all thought it was going to right, be, right. which is marketing deals, the ability to profit off your your your, your market ability. I want to uh, ask a couple of questions from the Tribal Council, uh, subscribers on the site who uh, asked some questions. And I'm kind of combining a few questions here, so I'm not going to – I think uh, Ben might bring up uh, some of their questions on the screen, but I'm um, combining a couple. But basically a couple of the questions were along the lines of logistically – how often are you hearing stories about players renegotiating their NIL deals or, and, or how long, uh, how, I guess, binding are they and, and that type of thing? Cause I think that's a question people have because you hear of kids maybe getting an NIL deal, but then still going in the portal. And, and then, you know, you, yeah. you hear these stories kind of going out in the background. Is there a common practices when it yeah, comes to that? You have a cat and mouse. Um, all right. So, most of these collective deals, even if they're verbally agreed to like, hey, over four years, you're going to make $800,000. For the most part, these deals are either on a renewable six month to one year contract, right? So the terms are shorter. So again, if I'm on a one year deal and I usually sign that, you know, after spring, right? Or in the fall, whatever it may be. If I decide to transfer, all right, well, I'm not going to get renewed on my contract. So that's one way. Like, I don't think you really have to worry about athletes being on a four-year deal, getting a lot of money up front and leaving. Um, we're not hearing stories of that. Also, you're getting paid out on a monthly. All right, so it's not like, all right, you get a $100,000 deal. Or for easy math, I'm not a big math guy. You get $120,000 a year, you get $10,000 a month. And then you have to do things for the, that money. So if the athlete's not doing what they're supposed to do or they leave, there's a breach of contract. Um, within those contracts, there's some cool provisions. Uh, you know, a lot of athletes oftentimes have to do appearances and those appearances are usually tied to areas close to the university, right? So if you transfer, let's say you're in Tallahassee and you transfer to Southern Cal, right? And you're not able to get back to Tallahassee for your appearances, you've reached the contract that allows the collective out of their deal, right? So again, you're not, you're not double dipping. And the last thing we're seeing is exclusivity deals. If you sign with my collective and you you give us, you know, grant us marketing rights to you, it's an exclusive deal. You can't sign with any other organization that's similarly situated to us. No other collectives. So if I'm at Florida State, I have a collective deal, and then I go to Southern Cal and I sign a collective deal over there, that negates and voids my contract. That is not tied to enrollment. That is very common, which is if you give me your marketing rights, no one else can have them. And if you want to leave, that's fine. You can get out of it. But we also get out of it on our end. So uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot of double dipping. Let's put it that way. I got a question from no fan in South Florida who uh, he says he met you two or three times already. I got. Uh, a, I actually saw him at an event and literally the next day I was at the Hard Rock meeting with some friends and I bumped into him at the bar. So yes, he's cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he says you're a good guy. But one of the things he said was that you have some interesting ideas and we, you and I have talked about this off air and I, I'm sure you're not going to offer them all up for the public, but he did say that he feels like you've got some interesting ideas for, you know, kind of the future of athletics and funding athletics. And yeah. is there anything you could kind of, uh, again, yeah, without giving, without giving away your uh, trade secrets, anything, any big picture topics you, you could maybe float out there a little bit. Schools don't control their logos. Schools don't control their, their multimedia rights. All right. I think we're going to get back to schools controlling it. Wouldn't it be great if there was a Florida State YouTube channel or some streaming channel like on a YouTube platform where we all paid $100 and you could see hard knocks for the football team or hard knocks for the volleyball team or a morning show, right? Or old classic games or 30 for 30 style documentaries or no one's broadcasting this volleyball game tonight, we're going to. No one's broadcasting the softball game tonight, we are. If the school did that, and they were able to get the rights together and they charge a hundred dollars for the year and they were able to get a hundred thousand people to pay for that. That's $10 million in additional revenue. You could probably get that in sponsorship ads as well. 
because when we get to revenue sharing, right, you're going to have to find additional revenue to pay out these athletes because we're not going to stop spending what we want to spend on elite coaches and facilities. So it's about finding additional revenue. And I really think what schools have done for a long time is they've outsourced their rights and they've outsourced their logos. You're always going to outsource the big stuff. Like ESPN is always going to have your football deals and all that. But there's so much content that's being underutilized and there's a market for it. I think that's the future of college athletics without getting into it too much. And that'd be great. I would, in a heartbeat, Pay ten dollars a month for access to a Florida State channel for all of that content. And and do you see a move towards maybe because always the challenge with this in this space is there's a, you have two choices as a business or as an athletics department. If you do it in house, now you got to hire a bunch of people. If you do it, if you if you outsource it, it's a lot cheaper on the front end. But now you're letting somebody else take a lot of that money. Um, do you do you envision a, for a long time there's been a process where or a system i would say of the schools kind of outsourcing as much of that as possible it's just gonna have to stop it it, it, it just will and it's gonna t- it's gonna cost money to make money but it's money that's necessary but it's it's not just money when you outsource everything you put the control of it in other people's hands we do a horrible job in this country of promoting sports that should be bigger college baseball should be much bigger in this country um college softball should be much bigger uh men's ice hockey women's soccer. These are all sports that even on the professional side, there's like actual followings, but for some reason in college, there isn't. And that's because people are lazy and they own the rights to it. They just don't do anything with it. Schools would be more concerned and have more of the opportunity to promote those sports and give you more access to it. And therefore bring in more followers, which eventually grows the game. It's, it's a win-win for everyone. And I, I know everyone's going to hate to hear this, but there's one school in the entire country that's ahead of the curve on this and already starting to do it. And they're in South Carolina and they go by Clemson university. They've already started to figure this out. Um, they are one of the more innovative athletic departments. They have been for a long time. And this is just another way they're innovating. And just to, you know, to clarify, this isn't just a, a college issue. You know, okay. if you look at pro sports, I mean, look at fanatics, you know, all yeah. these pro sports teams have just given over all of their merchandise to fanatics because they don't want to deal with it. And then, but then you've got issues. One issue I would think is customers in terms of the quality. You'll hear people complain about the quality. Well, you can't really complain to the club team because they've given it over Correct. to Fanatics. So the, um, the only difference is, is what Fanatics does a really good job though is the promotion of those items, right? Oh, and, incredible job! The marketing right? where where Learfield, right, or Brand are, or even ESP, where they do a terrible job is promoting certain sports like. All right, cool. There's a softball game on the ESPN Plus app, and no one's promoting it. No one's advertising. No one's pumping it. Like, cool. It's out there. Big deal. Like, uh, you know, that, that's the problem. For sure. Um, okay, Noel up north is the last question I was going to ask from the message boards. Will uh, Pete, you've already answered a few of the questions on the message board, and uh, we'll go. If there's anything we missed that we didn't get covered, we'll we'll go into the message board and uh, answer those. But he asked a question. I think it, that's been out there, and it may be something that's changing based on the conversation we've had so far. Has there been a discussion about booster organizations being able to provide booster benefits yeah. to NIL donors? Um, so in the state of Florida, in, in the state of Florida, that's illegal. Right? That's what we're seeing in Texas and Arkansas. Um, I just think, all right, I'm torn on this because I'm a big believer that we need uniform rules that everyone's playing by for competitive balance purposes. That's why I'm anti what Texas did. I'm anti what um, Oklahoma did. I'm anti what Missouri did. But I kind of agree with their with their laws, which is one, we want the schools to be in a little bit more control because they're they're going to be they're going to follow the rules a little bit more. But two, let's bring it back. If we get to group licensing where you, you have the, you know real NIL has to do with either non logos or logos, and you have to work with the school, you might as well allow the ability and incentivize local businesses and donors to get involved by allowing those those points to be given. And so I think the future is that's going to be allowed. I think when we look back in two or three years, we're going to look back and say, I get why the NCAA did it. They were trying to figure it out, but that was the wrong move. So I'm pro the NCAA going after these people, not following the rules. I would also like the NCAA to adopt those rules. And that'll make things a whole lot easier, I would think, for these schools and these booster organizations. Because right now, it's like they're trying to serve two masters. You don't, you don't want to um, take away the donations you're getting for the athletics department, but you also don't want people to stop giving to the NIL because 
in this day and age, I mean, player acquisition, that's, it's a piece of it. It's a piece of it. And let's be honest about what's happening. The schools are working with their booster clubs or their collectives trying to figure out what's best. And it's like, all right, but we have to, we have to keep this separation of church and state, even though we are work, remove it all, bring it all in house. Listen, schools have compliance departments. They have HR departments. They have legal teams. They'll be much more equipped to make sure no one's breaking the rules. So I don't know how most people feel about Congress in in Washington, D.C. We all have our own opinions about whether or not something's going to get done. I don't know that I believe something's going to get done in five or six months. I don't know uh, if maybe two years. But I think, you know, I'm coming away from this conversation. I hope other people are at least feeling like, and I, and I, I, I think this is your position, is that if you're frustrated right now by NIL, NIL, you're concerned, you don't feel like you feel like we're spinning, the world is spinning out of control in college athletics. Within a couple of years, it does feel, you feel like things are in place where there will be some sort of leveling of the playing field and we just got to get through it to get to that yeah. point. In three years, we'll be there. And then in four to five years, when, when the dust settles, we'll look back and be like, man, that was a, that was a roller coaster, but the, <laughs> the sport's in a better place than it ever was. And this is, this is awesome. And we can kind of just get back to having fun on Twitter and, or threads and posting memes. Well, I call you NIL Stradamus for a reason, and uh, hopefully uh, you come through again. If people have watched our videos in the past, you've always been on top of what's going to happen uh, in, in 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 this space, and I think uh, you bring a great service by joining us here at War Chant. So I appreciate it, man. You're a good guy, an FSU guy. People can follow you on our message boards, obviously, at NIL Pete, and also on Twitter at NIL Pete. And uh, you got a thread yet? You've got, have you jumped onto the uh... – I have one. I haven't done anything with it. I'm very torn. Uh, you know, Everyone's like, ah, oh, let's – Let's get on thread. Screw Elon. And it's like, yeah, let's get on Mark Zuckerberg's. But I don't know. I, don't know. I, I, I stay out of it. Um, also, NIL Pete is like taken on Instagram. So like, I'm, I'm what? Lost. I don't know what to do. So if, you, if you're listening and you have NIL Pete on Instagram, just give it to me. We'll, give we'll, it up. Yeah, we got to make it happen. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it, man. I, I know our viewers do as well. And uh, look forward to um, talking to you in the future. And Again, if you're a War Chant subscriber, go to the Travel Council. There's more of this conversation, and, and, and you never know when uh, you tag Pete on the message boards, he may show up and uh, uh, share some wisdom for you. So I, I will. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Ira. Go Knowles.